All right. So in the book, uh, you mentioned a few different things, customer selection, hiring, data in the CRM. Um, but what do you mean, uh, just for clarity and, the, and for the listeners, what do you mean when you say that the cost of false positives are increasing in environments like this? Yeah. Well, first of all, Derek, thank you very much for inviting me. My yeah. pleasure uh, to be with you and virtually with uh, whoever's watching our podcast. It's an honor for me. Now, about your question, first of all, you know, definition of terms, I'm using the statistical jargon, right? right. The statisticians talk about type one, type two error. Type one error is a false positive, type two, a false negative. Why are false positives in sales a bigger deal when you have an inflationary environment, which it looks like we will have right. for quite some time? And let's cross our fingers and hope people are wrong, but perhaps a recession as well. Now, what you learn in any finance course you will ever take anywhere is that a dollar today is always worth more than a dollar tomorrow. But that's especially true in an inflationary environment. When, when you have inflation, a dollar today is worth a heck of a lot more than a dollar tomorrow. Now, in most organizations, the vast majority, the single biggest driver of time to cash is the selling cycle, right? right. Uh, and what that means, and I think you're going to see a lot more attention on this, uh, really for reasons of survival, especially among SaaS firms, what that means is if you can decrease that selling cycle by a day, a week, a month, that is money in the bank, and that's very, very important money in the bank in this environment. It also means that as a selling cycle lengthens, which is what recessions tend to do, more and more uncertainty, as the selling cycle lengthens, false positives, the time, the effort, the money you spend chasing a prospect during that selling cycle also becomes increasingly expensive. Now, what do you do about this? You know, besides bemoaning the fact that there's inflation, maybe a recession, what you've got to do is simply get much more rigorous about your lead qualification criteria. Okay. It's a basic issue in most sales models, but an issue that has gotten nowhere near enough attention in the past decade when top line growth sort of trumped a variety of other things. Now, that's a long, windy explanation, but that's what I mean about the cost of false positives. It's a basic issue in business. Money, time, and attention that a company spends on account A is money, time, and attention simply not available for accounts B, C, D, et cetera. Got it. And then touch on the hiring aspect of this as well. I would imagine the same principle applies to bringing in the wrong talent. Yes, uh, that is true. But I think when it comes to um, hiring and sales, uh, I'd let, let me step back uh, on that question, Derek. The first thing I think is important to recognize is that there have always been and continue to be challenges in sales hiring that simply do not exist in most other business functions. For example, if you want to hire uh, someone in finance or accounting or an engineer, or for that matter, a computer programmer, you can go to a school and it's a little bit like walking into a food court. You know, what mm -hmm. are you interested in? Electrical engineering, chemical engineering, et cetera. In sales, however, it's a very different story. Last time I looked, which was about three and a half years ago when I started writing the book, uh, that you've been kind enough to mention. The last time I looked, of the 4,000 plus colleges and universities in the United States, less than 300 even offered a sales course, let alone a sales program. Now, what does that mean? It means that the vast majority of people start out in this line of work <laughs> knowing very little about what they're going to get paid for. And that leads to the next important fact about hiring and sales. Um, turnover rates in sales tend to vary 
between 20 to 30% hmm. annually. It's higher in strong economic conditions when talent has more options. It's lower when the economy is faltering and talent has fewer options, but it tends to vary between 20 and 30% every year. Now, what does that mean? What it means is that for most companies, they in effect have to hire, train, socialize the equivalent of the entire sales force every three to four years. That's a huge undertaking. And in fact, if you add up the amount of money in hiring, training and development and sales, it's usually bigger as a number, bigger than the biggest CapEx, capital expenditure mm -hmm. projects in the company, wow. but it usually gets much, much less attention than CapEx expenditures do. So sales hiring uh, has always been um, is always been difficult, will always remain difficult. What do you do about that? Well, the first thing you do is get beyond these myths about hiring in sales. Mm -hmm. Sales is a very, very diverse activity. Selling software is different than selling capital goods, is different than selling professional services, et cetera. There is no one size fits all. It depends on your sales model and the tasks inherent in your sales model. And that's what I mean. Hire for the task, not somebody's experience somewhere else where they had a different strategy, different sales model, et cetera. And you've also said that the tasks, I think, because of our conditions, our environmental, environmental conditions are, are changing, the tasks are changing. Um, and therefore, the skills required are also changing. And I think this also connects to buyer behavior as well. So yeah. because of the, infl you know, with recession on a looming and these things that are in front of us, you know, all of this other change is happening, buyer, tasks, and therefore our skills. So we should be vetting differently for salespeople. It should be, are there certain skills, if you were looking at an account executive that you're bringing to the business, what is that skill that has changed that maybe you weren't really hyper-focused on last year that you would be focused on this year? Yeah, well, again, the particular, any particular answer to that good question is going to depend, again, on the context. An yeah. account executive in a software business just has different tasks True. than an account executive, uh, you know, selling medical devices uh, or something uh, like that. Fair. But again, let's step back. I think there are two things that make the ability to stay in touch with what is really going on out there today, not yesterday, mm -hmm. very important in sales hiring. Now, what I'm about to say when I say it may sound glib, but it's a fundamental truth about business that is often ignored. When you're running a business, you do not compete with the dead. And what I mean by that mm. is you don't compete with companies that have gone out of business, their, their history, as we say. You compete with the people who survive. Now, what does it take to survive in any competitive activity? You've got to adopt best practices. Okay. You've got to keep improving. What that means, and sales is basically exhibit A for this, what it means, and this is part of the glory of capitalism, but it means that the bar is always rising. I mean, for example, you'll see data in my book that, um, you know, and it's based on pretty darn good research about tens of thousands of sales job descriptions, activities that as recently as a decade ago were considered cutting edge are now table stakes. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's what you should expect. What you should expect is that the bar is always rising. And again, that's part of the job of hiring, knowing what the tasks are that are important today, not yesterday. And again, that is going to change because of conditions. SaaS is a good example of this. You know, most SaaS models, inbound marketing models, depend on various digital marketing media to bring in leads at the top of the funnel. Well, those media, because of the pandemic, 
have gotten exponentially more expensive. That's exactly <laughs> the right way to do it. Uh, you know, I just had uh, the library here at Harvard do some research about this. And basically what you see over the last three years is a graph like this in oh. terms of um, expense, the right. mm -hmm. and a graph like this in terms of clicks, you know, click rates, conversion rates. Oh, wow. there, so cost is going up and the effectiveness of it That's is going right. down. It is a classic example of the mm -hmm. law of diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's a joke that's currently making its way among uh, chief marketing officers in Silicon Valley. And the joke is, where is the best place to bury a body? And the Ooh, answer is page. <laughs> page two. That's right. Page two of Google or whatever. No one goes there. No that's one. where you find Jimmy Hoffa. Now, this gets us back to your first question about false positives. Mm -hmm. That's where lead qualification criteria are important. Okay. That's where in a SaaS model, the young people that we tend to call sales development representatives, right. it's no longer a place for amateurs. They've got to be much, much better at discovery calls and ways of thinking about who really is worth chasing and who is not. So again, a long-winded answer yeah. to the question, but context is important in sales. Absolutely. And, and the qualification piece that you had mentioned, that also, you know, we, we mentioned lead qualification. So I think for some of the audience, you might be thinking about someone has downloaded some assets, they've conducted some behavior on your website that looks like they're fitting. And so you're reaching out to them and or they've raised their hand and filled out a form and they're coming inbound. So in some cases, it's an inbound motion. But I think what we're also talking about is in the outbound, making sure that our propensity analysis are, are fine tuned and we're targeting accounts that we believe are a better fit. So the targeting and, well, and that, that's right. And mm -hmm. notice what's going on there, by the way, because, again, this is uh, fundamentally not good news for the kind of sales model that you're talking about. Uh, what was the basic promise and attraction of much of the activity that you're describing? Yes, this may be expensive, but we can target in ways we couldn't with other media. Well, privacy regulations are significantly impacting that and making it much more difficult. Uh, so, you know, you have to ask yourself increasingly who, if you're in a B2B business, who has the time to sort of download a white paper, give me that information? Is it a decision maker? Is it someone with a budget? Or is it, you know, some person at their computer who frankly has nothing better to do than, uh, than uh, surf the web? Th this is a big and bigger right. deal for these. The false sales. positives of the noise that we, we yeah. see, the signals that we're, we're consuming to determine our, our next steps and our priorities, right? Exactly. So those signals can be false positives is your point. Got it. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about your career at Harvard. Uh, it's an honor, obviously, to be speaking with a senior lecturer, but you were also a professor for many years there uh, from 80s through the 90s. Now you're back on another 15 uh, year stint. So it's about 30 years combined at Harvard. How would you briefly summarize your experience at Harvard? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, I don't consider my background particularly uh, exotic. You, you've, you've summarized it well. I you know, I was a professor, um, started in marketing, uh, made my way up the hierarchy. Then I left with some others. Uh, we started a business. I ran that business for a decade and we got lucky. Uh, when need be, Derek, I can spin this a different way. But the truth is, it was dumb luck. We sold at the right time. And I, um, Good for you. Uh, I came back um, uh, to Harvard to teach. And I can tell your listeners um, you know, teaching at a decent uh, business school after you've made real money is a good life. I mean, you know, I have, <laughs> I have no complaints. Um, you ask about my experience there. I mean, over 30 years, it's very, very different. I mean, for example, when I started um, teaching at Harvard Business School just about uh, 30 years ago, I was one of the very, very few, you know, people who taught sales. Mm -hmm. And 30 years ago, you really had to work with the MBAs to convince them that if they were serious about profitable growth in business, they should really learn something about sales. They all, at the time, they were all interested in strategy. When I got back 
about 10 years ago, uh, the worm had turned. It was 180 degrees. The, all they wanted to talk about was sales. And I had to convince them that even the world's best sales model cannot substitute for a flawed business strategy. So things change in education and the mindsets of uh, student groups, just as they do uh, in other activities. Yeah, I got it. The where, So where do your students end up? I mean, you mentioned MBAs. I mean, are, and you've probably taught thousands of students. Do you have a pulse check on like where they end up, like where fields they end up going into, what careers oh, yeah. they embark on? No, we have it? more than a pulse check. We okay. uh, we have uh, act very, very specific data about okay. that because uh, a very few years after graduation, we're going to ask them for money. So, <laughs> okay. this, you know, this yeah. is, uh, yeah. trust me, we understand, <laughs> yeah. we understand that customer conversion process. <laughs> Last data I looked, and by the way, this the only data I know is for Harvard Business School. I have really have no idea uh, whether it's representative of other schools. But right now, if you look at uh, the um, the data for uh, HBS MBAs, almost fifteen percent upon graduation, even as they're loaded with debt, either start a business or join an early stage venture. It's about 15%. Okay. There's about another 30% that goes into what you and I would call consulting, you know, the big consulting firms and others. But even there, because of the up or out dynamic in most consulting firms, if you mm -hmm. track them five years down the road, uh, the majority of those people are out of consulting and another big chunk either go into um, entrepreneurial ventures or other places. Uh, then the uh, remainder, let's uh, talk about the, the remaining 55% and where you should expect to see uh, MBA graduates, uh, investment banking, consumer packaged goods, mm. uh, et cetera. The other big change, and again, I'm speaking about my institution, I think it's now in excess of 40% uh, of our uh, MBAs. Uh, are not from the United States. Hmm. Uh, so it's a very global population. And there it depends upon what is going on in the country uh, in terms of business. So it's all over the place, but that's a very, very different mix than it was 20 or 25 years ago. 20, 25 years ago, 60 plus percent of the graduates went into either investment banking or consulting. That has shrunk dramatically over the past two decades. Wow, and so tremendous insights there. I did not expect such a detailed response. I thought we might generalize a bit, but that's uh, it does make sense the way you tee it up in terms of the, the conversion model and why you would track that so closely. You don't build an endowment without having good data. Right, exactly. So you've been focused on sales uh, management, sales practices, and the profession of it for a long time. And I'm curious, though, can you quantify or maybe talk about the types of research or preparedness that goes into shaping your views and your lectures um, and your lessons? You know, what, what has shaped this viewpoint as a lecturer and these areas that are important for, for businesses to be aware of? Well, I mean, in my case, and again, I can only speak about myself, uh, there's basically three major inputs uh, hmm. for um, the research I do about sales. I ran a business for 11 years. And when you run a business and you've got to meet payroll every month, it doesn't matter what your background is, you develop an appreciation for sales, selling, and the ability to close a deal and time to cash. So part of it is I draw on my 10, 11 years, and I was fortunate. It was a, a professional services business hmm. where um, we had a very, very good client list. So I saw a lot uh, across a variety of industries. Secondly, uh, at Harvard Business School, our core methodology, as everyone knows, is case studies. I've probably written as many cases as uh, most professors have. And I think that's especially important in sales and marketing. 
finance, you know, we can argue about this, but there are certain ways to do a net present value calculation, the capital asset pricing model, et cetera. But in sales and marketing, as I said earlier, context is very, very important. That's what case studies are about. Case studies, among other things, are about all of that uh, context. So that's the other uh, input. And then the third input is the work I do as a consultant, sitting on boards, mm -hmm. sitting on advisory boards, et cetera. And again, I've been very, very uh, fortunate that way. I, um, uh, I've, I've, had a, uh, I've had the opportunity uh, to basically work on other people's dimes mm -hmm. quite a bit. So that, that would be the way I answer uh, uh, the question. Got it. Yeah. So the yeah, very, you know, uh, extensive fact pattern recognition sort of track record established there in a variety of input models. I appreciate that. I think the one of the reasons I asked that is, um, you know, one of the reasons I started this podcast was to improve as a consultant and to reach out to folks like yourself that are in the space that I can learn from. And so this is an input model for me in how I answer that question and how I improve, how I become a better consultant with, with my clients. Um, switching gears and I'm going to start unpacking the book here a little bit with you. Uh, we're going to get into a, a variety of topics here in a moment, but it hit me recently in another interview I was conducting where the guest said that most people know what to do. They just don't do it. When we think about sales management and the importance of coaching our people and focusing on the individual in these areas, why is it that and this is going to be your, your, whatever your best guess or your, your informed opinion might be. Why is it that sales managers know to coach? I mean, in life, we know what to do, generally speaking, as people, but we don't do it as well. I don't know if it's, you know, procrastination or whatever you want to call it, but managers know they need to coach. Reps know they need to prospect. What's the inhibitor that you've identified in your years of experience that prevents them from making that transition? If I met with my manager and but regularly, and he's coaching me and told me the areas of improvement, my strengths. If I've, as a manager, you know, I, I, I know what areas need to be improved, but maybe I'm just not getting to it. And we can talk about being busy with other areas of the business, but there's something else there. There has to be. And I just want to, I'm, I'm curious, what's your opinion on why as managers or as individual contributors, we don't do what we know we need to do? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what you're um, pointing to, Derek, is something that uh, has certainly been true throughout my 30-year career. And I think this is an important point to notice about uh, business. When you hear the same damn thing, decade after decade after decade, it is very unlikely that what we're talking about is a few bad apples. There's something systemic going on. And I would point to three um, areas that contribute uh, to this um, uh, issue that you're talking about. The first is basic human behavior. You know, I think mm -hmm. it was, um, was it Henry Ford who said, you can't build a reputation on what you're going to do, mm -hmm. right? You have to do it. Uh, there's a wonderful Italian aphorism, uh, between, between the saying and the doing lies the ocean. That's basically <laughs> right. translation. Uh, and, you know, that's just true yeah. of human beings in general. Right. Secondly, if we get to sales in particular, there are very, very important systemic reasons why this is the case in sales. Um, step back. Uh, so many other decisions and resource allocations in most companies depend on sales forecasts and the ability of the sales force to actually meet those forecasts. As a result, sales and sales managers in particular are under pressure. I love this jargon we use in tech, predictable revenue, right? As though that were an act of willpower as opposed to the market. That predictable revenue, that ability to meet the numbers every week, every month, every quarter, generally is reinforced by the metrics in sales. You know, I remember one of the case studies I wrote when I was a brand new professor, and I kept talking about the long term. And this executive looked at me and he said, Frank, let me tell you something about my role in sales. 
if I don't survive the short term, I don't have to worry about the long term, right? So that's sales. And what that means is that sales uh, managers in particular, they're, they're, they've got to meet those numbers and they're actually very conservative this way. They may talk innovation, but they're conservative because they have an incentive to stick with the devil they know. Even if it's a rep that's not doing well, I got to move on uh, uh, to uh, the next one. And then the third reason, and, and uh, I think this is something that the larger companies have to bear some of the blame for, but doing performance reviews, coaching is a very, very trainable skill. It's not like a lot of things that we talk about in business or in business schools, you know, metaphysics, purpose, whatever that mm -hmm. is. Yeah, nebulous things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they don't provide training in this. And notice what the transition is in salespeople's careers when they move from salesperson to sales manager. They're moving from an individual contributor role. And usually they've been pretty darn good at that if they're getting promoted. But once you become a manager, by definition, you have to get things done through others. That's where the coaching, the performance reviews, the other things you're talking about are so vital. But um, that's a tough transition in any line of work, but especially in sales. Most people go into sales because they value the autonomy. Right. I make my numbers. They leave me alone. Friday, right. I go golfing. Yeah. Single biggest complaint I've heard about sales managers throughout my career. You know, we made Charlie or Charlotte sales manager. They were a great salesperson. They continue to be a great salesperson, but they don't manage. So this issue is part of that larger career transition that is built in uh, to this functional area in business. Piggybacking on that, do you think we're holding ourselves hostage with commission plans and quarterly targets? You, you kind of talked about the short term. And the reason I asked this, I listened to an interview that Chris Voss, the author of Don't Split the Difference, former hostage negotiator, gave with John Burroughs. And, you know, he's not necessarily from uh, his original background, obviously isn't in, in business, but he runs a business now. And he believes that we're holding ourselves hostage, uh, pun intended, with the commission plans and the uh, quarterly targets. If we move to salary only for our salespeople, would that help address the problem? I don't think so okay. uh, myself uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is uh, this gets you, gets us back to the first question um, you, um, uh, you asked me, but it is important to keep the cash flowing. <laughs> so mm -hmm, yeah. you know, we can we can set targets any way we want, but if we run out of cash, it doesn't matter whether we've been short term or long term. <laughs> so that's that's number one. Number two is uh, basically a philosophy of human motivation. Uh, I do have colleagues. Uh, it's not just Chris Voss, but I've got colleagues who will tell you that monetary incentives are way overrated. It's all about intrinsic rewards. All I can say is that's not the planet I've lived on for over 50 years. Anyone who tells you that incentives don't affect behavior, I think is basically living mentally in, uh, in Disney World. But in sales in particular, you've got to think about compensation as a necessary but not sufficient cause of getting the behaviors you want, which is why coaching, performance management, um, et cetera, is so important. And then when it comes to sales comp in particular, I would argue the bigger issue there is not uh, how we set the time frame. The market will ultimately set the time frame. I mean, we can pretend that we're setting a longer term time frame, but it's going to be determined by the market. I think the bigger issue is how sales comp works in most companies. Uh, and uh, the data about this has been remarkably consistent throughout uh, my career. If you ask yourself, how do you maximize your variable commission compensation in 70 plus percent of sales forces, the answer is very simple. Just sell more. Yeah. And by the way, it's all about volume, end of paragraph, end of sentence, not the profitability of that sale, not your company's cost to serve 
that customer, simply volume. Now notice what the message is to the sales force. And by the way, they they understand this message very clearly. We just need bodies and seats. We don't care who it. those bodies there is, are. There is no such thing as a bad customer. customer. Mm. So they bring in a whole diversity of customers, fragments the business model. This is finance. That's your problem to collect payments. Customer success. That's your problem to fix those problems. And and that's the classic mm. scaling Bermuda Triangle for venture. So I don't think the issue is uh, you know. Let's let's look long term. There's good academic research about stock incentives, et cetera. And there's very little evidence that the market actually is too short term oriented. As usual, management makes a difference. And a lot of this in sales is simply not managed well, which, by the way, is an opportunity. Notice the implication of this. If you're an entrepreneur, you'll be amazed how far you can get, how much competitive advantage there is in doing the basics a little bit better than the next company. So that that's the way I would see this. But I I disagree with this issue about let's just let's just think longer term. Right. Okay. Thank you. Switching of gears uh, again back into the book. You can you break down the concepts of adaptive selling and active retrieval. These hit home for me. And I don't know, a light bulb went off and I read it in the book. And again, if you are listening to this podcast for maybe the first time, make sure you go out and get Sales Manager That Works by Frank Cespedes. This book I read last year really just changed a lot of paradigms for me and how I approach my practice and working with clients. So I'll finish the question here. You, you mentioned adaptive selling and active retrieval. How might that influence how we manage and train our reps? Well, by adaptive selling, I'm simply using jargon that's been around for decades, but it it's jargon that points to the following reality in most sales organizations. During the course of a month, a week, in, some, in many companies during the course of a day, sales reps have to deal with a whole diversity of buyers, buying processes, buying criteria. And what good salespeople learn to do is adapt to those differences. Now, that's an important point to uh, point out because it, it shows us the limitations of training me methodologies in sales. You know, notice training firms have a huge incentive to say our methodology will work with your company, that company, and with companies on Jupiter, Mars, and Venus. But it's not true. Buying contexts differ and good salespeople understand that. So that's what's meant by adaptive selling. Now, active retrieval is the terminology that learning theorists use for the way you learn from experience. And basically, uh, sales is a very, very good example of this. Over time, what good salespeople learn is where articulating the value proposition this way works where it doesn't work. And again, to use the learning theorist jargon, in effect, they develop what they call scripts. Now, by scripts, they don't mean glib pitches, but they develop in a repertory of experiences that tell them this kind of buyer, not that kind of buyer. Uh, that's, that's essentially what active retrieval is about. Now, what do we do about that? You know, aside from saying, wow, aren't human beings interesting, complex, and adaptive? We do a couple of things. One is, this is a fundamental fact about adult learning, but especially in sales. Adults tend to pay attention to information when and where they need it. And sales people in particular pay attention to information not weeks or months earlier or later in a training seminar, but on their way to making an important sales call or even during the sales conversation itself. Right, right. This is an area where the newer sales enablement technologies can really help. Okay. Because what those technologies allow good sales managers to do is disseminate best practice. Notice how this person responded to this objection. Notice how your colleague X dealt with this price issue. 
and they in, increasingly the technology is available in the media that salespeople are most comfortable with their phone, the iPad, uh, et cetera. Um, th that, that is uh, what I mean by adaptive uh, selling and active retrieval. They're jargon for fundamental aspects of the way most reps manage their day. I love that. And the active retrieval piece, you mentioned earlier, uh, improving about our, 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 our qualification with inbound leads or you know even our targeting. So that qualification, and what I go to in that is qualification frameworks, qualification gating questions, and these kinds of things. And how do we get better at uncovering the fit or non-fit and the qualify in or out of this prospect? So is that an example of active retrieval? If I'm in conversation with a prospect and I know that my, let's just say Bant, I know it's old school and it's been, people give it a lot of you know uh, grief, but let's use it as an example you know, I'm I'm recalling active retrieval, the budget authority need timeline. Therefore, it's triggering me to ask associated questions in these different categories. It, that's a dynamic that's unique to sales, unlike any other profession that you might find, right? Because you are in that moment, in that conversation, need to recall something that's uh, static in itself, but you're in a dynamic situation. Uh, so the skill set of a person to be able to recall that framework is a skill set that we have to be able to facilitate. Is that right? I would agree, but I think the value of any framework is not in the framework itself. Bant okay. is a good example. I mean, I don't care whether we call it Bant or dips or asparagus. <laughs> it is important in sales to know who's a decision maker, who has a budget and who isn't, right? So, you know, the acronyms don't matter much. But all of the value is not in the framework itself. It's in how the individual executes the framework. In this instance, the questions they ask. And again, this is where management makes a difference. Sales is an area of business, much more so than almost any other business function, where the best in the group are not just a little bit better than the average, there are orders of magnitude better. There are such things as stars in most sales forces. Now, what do you want to do? A, you obviously want to keep those stars motivated, but B, you want to disseminate their best practice. Again, this is where the tech can help. The issue is not are we all trained in BANT or whatever. The issue is how do I execute it through questions? And what we know, what we know for a fact from research is that most salespeople learn the most, not from a professor, not from a training consultant, but by watching the best of their peers do it. You know, Derek, the way you, the, the questions you ask to get at that, that, that's clever. I'm gonna use that next time. Again, this is where the tech makes that increasingly accessible and frankly, less expensive mm -hmm. than bringing them all in for the training seminar for two days, you know, which has sort of been the norm for the previous century. Right. So in, in that example, uh, you mentioned the tech, uh, using tools that provide conversational intelligence and have calls that are recorded. And, you know, those that are maybe uh, in an onboarding library, Right. So that yeah. as I'm coming onto the business, I can go into that library and the see, gongs of the world. Right. And listen to it. The show pads. Again, I, I don't get a commission for selling any of that. Neither but these are these are tools that help in this basic area of professional development. And again, getting back to your earlier question, the you would you should expect this in any competitive activity. The bar is always rising. If right. you stay where you are you're going to go out of business. You've right. got to get those people better and better. And inflation, recession, the layoffs that are now, you know, simply following the SaaS crash. I think all of that uh, makes this even more and more imperative. And, you know, again, one of the things we should expect in business, some people will figure it out and others won't. And the ones that do will be history. Right. And Managers need to get out of the way in that respect, right? I think sometimes as leaders, and I've been guilty of this, thinking that I'm going to fix my reps. I'm going to help them improve. I take it on my shoulders as their coach and manager to get them better and fix them, if you will. I think in some cases we got to do better at the 
knowledge transfer and facilitating this peer-to-peer -peer training mechanism. We have teach back presentations where we have reps come in and kind of lead uh, a session on something, but the technology that can facilitate this, I think at the core though, is it's a, is on sales management to facilitate that, uh, that learning modality, right? I, I agree with that part uh, of what you said. I think that's exactly right. And I think you phrase it very well, Derek, facilitating that modality where we know uh, uh, salespeople learn the most. The phrase, however, managers need to get out of the way, like most phrases of that sort, I think it depends on how one interprets that. Right. If the interpretation is yours, which is guess what? I'm pretty good. That's why I became a sales manager, but I don't know everything. And by the way, my real field experience was whatever it was, X years in the past, and the market has evolved. I would agree that's a good interpretation of get out of the way. But I think the way many sales managers interpret that is to downplay the importance of performance mm -hmm. reviews and account one-on-ones. Yeah. I think you said in the book that one of, one of the most important activities, revenue generating activities that a manager could participate in is running effective one-on-ones with their people. Yeah. And again, trainable skill, but talk to HR people. It is their constant complaint about sales managers. And I think, again, it's important to understand not only why that's important in terms of uh, human capital, engagement, et cetera, but why it's also important in terms of a company's business model. The most important data relevant to selling is about the buyer, who buys, why, and how. You know, I always say this to executives, uh, it sounds obvious until, you know, uh, once you say it, but in the history of business since the Phoenicians, a market has never bought anything. Only individual customers and accounts do. Now, how do we get at that data? Most companies rely on this CRM system, which is notoriously noisy data, not because of the software. Software is fine, but as usual, because of the inputs. One rep says a lead is anybody they bumped into at a conference. Another rep says, no, they have to have a budget, et cetera. All the CRM system does is give you the aggregate of all of those noisy inputs. And by the way, this will also be true with artificial intelligence. The old saying remains, garbage in, garbage out. The really important data only becomes evident when you do a good performance and account review. So managers, sales managers who don't do that well are not only perpetuating a culture of underperformance, but they're inhibiting the flow of vital data in the organization. Mm. By the way, one of the uh, developments that's going on, and this is uh, because of the uh, data revolution in business, uh, increasingly this data flows up not to the CRO, the chief revenue officer, but it flows up to the data people who in many, many companies now report to finance. So, the, so you're talking about business know, intelligence uh, organizations right. that yeah. are looking at the Tableau instances and yeah. working through data warehousing to normalize these disparate tools and looking at the macro to understand what the, the impressions of the business and those trends are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once that happens, you know, as I'm sure you and others uh, listening to us have discovered, finance people are very, very annoying. They are annoying people. They can't help themselves. Once they get data, they start to ask questions. And the requirements for financial literacy in sales management are increasing tremendously. If you're, if you're 40 years old or younger and you want to make a career in this area, my advice is don't go to the next seminar about selling. Make sure that you understand what I call managerial finance, not finance the way it's taught in business schools. That's Wall Street finance, but managerial finance, cash in, cash out, how to read a balance sheet, et cetera. What does drive cost to serve and return on capital in our business? Many sales managers are not very good at any of that once you get beyond top line volume, 
Uh, but that that's a trend that's not going to go away. It's only going to increase, in my opinion. Fair. Last two questions for you, and I'll let you go. I've appreciated the time so far. So we'll we'll turn third and head home. The first question is about accountability. I've asked this of pretty much every guest that I've had on the show so far. Uh, do you feel, from your vantage point, that accountability might be under attack? Meaning, it's hard to have tough conversations with underperforming individuals for a lot of different reasons. Managers may not be fully prepared and trained on how to do that. You mentioned about the importance of running effective performance reviews and one-on-ones. Uh, the expectation of the employee, I think, is changing as well, the rep, right? The same way we have buyer behaviors that are changing, our the, the behavior and expectations of our employees are changing with different generations coming into the organization. Uh, you know, the the legality aspect of it, HR business partners are doing a really good job of holding their frontline managers accountable to very empathetic approaches and making sure that, you know, we don't get in trouble as an organization, but also making sure that we are living our, our credo. It's, there's all these different, it's a myriad of things out there that make it hard for a frontline manager to have a tough conversation, I believe, from, from my vantage. But I think what, what I see often is leaders, managers that kind of steer away from having the conversation in general. And therefore, you know, you, we kind of promote this idea of underperformance and mediocrity. I think you kind of touched on that earlier, but do you think accountability in itself and having tough conversations around areas of improvement is, is getting difficult, more difficult? Do you feel as if the climate around us with mindfulness and these different uh, trends are making it increasingly difficult for a frontline manager to have that, that tough conversation? Well, I mean, my answer is going to be yes and no, but okay. uh, I think it's important to unpack a number of things uh, inherent in your question. The way you're using the word accountability, Derek, I think is, hey, do we really pay attention to results, right, as opposed to um, uh, sentiments? I would argue that in sales, um, don't worry about that aspect of accountability in sales. Again, okay. I'll get back to that executive 30 years ago. Frank, if you don't survive the short term in sales, you don't have to worry about the long term. Now, there is a rhetoric issue, and I would agree we are in an inflationary period of rhetoric. But again, at the end of the day, business, unlike government, unlike a university, unlike a not-for-profit, Business has a market test. And that gets me to the second dimension of what you're saying. I think a lot of that rhetoric, especially where you are, you know, in fundamentally a tech yeah, sector, yeah. Mm -hmm. was driven by the, um, the labor issues that were in place for much of the last decade. You want to get one of the best meals on the planet? Don't go to the Four Seasons, go to Google's cafeteria, right? Facebook, that yeah. also generates a lot of the other rhetoric. Uh, you know, that changes when the labor markets change. And then the third, and I think you're using the right phrase, the tough conversations, because at the end of the day, uh, performance discussions are not a, simply about building up the other person's confidence, although that is, that is important part of it. in mm -hmm. sales but it is also about continuous improvement. My experience there, and I, uh, uh, I would argue that this is always true, it is not tough to do that simply because of the rhetoric or because of, quote, the new generation. There's actually a good bit of research by a guy. Uh, he, uh, it's a recent book. It's called Generations. Uh, and um, what I think he demonstrates with data, as opposed to anecdotes, is the, you know, Gen X, Y, Z, the similarities overwhelm the differences. You know, I mean, look, you know, once upon a time, I had a full head of hair. Believe me, my generation, when I was 25 years old, was talked about just the way we now talk about, you know, Fair. these kids today. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, the big issue is moving from 25 to 35, building a family. Those things are over uh, are, are uh, overrated, the differences. The real issue, I think, is as usual with the managers. They don't like that conflict. I, I remember the first performance review, first time I had to fire uh, somebody in the business I ran. You know, I'm not that big a, a person, all right? I, I don't, I don't uh, press weights. 
Um, this fellow I thought was going to hit me. I was physically intimidated. It's not like I welcomed the next performance review. Uh, and again, independent of violence, that's usually not the issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a reason that LinkedIn is called LinkedIn. We want to be liked. And this is true of sales managers as well. Right. But that's part of their responsibility. Part of their responsibility is to have those conversations. You know, I always quote to managers the, uh, you know, the comment you see in the gangster movies. Remember, you chose this life. And if you don't like to do this, maybe you should choose another line of work. So I am, mm -hmm. uh, I'm much more uh, sanguine, much more optimistic about this, again, because of the market tests, uh, rhetoric is rhetoric. When it comes to empathy, that's always important, of right? Course. Any sales Feeling force people. is made up of different individuals. Accountability doesn't mean being, being an asshole. There's a difference between the two. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's something I'm always trying to get better at as, as a fractional manager in, in some cases. So, for, you know, giving that and delivering that feedback and coaching people up and, you know, focusing on the strengths, of course. I'm a big believer in strength finders and focusing on the areas that they're focused on. But at the same time, there's areas that we need to improve. And sometimes not everybody's very receptive to that. And it might be in our communication style. So we have to kind of well, own that. Yeah, but I would point out one other thing, because again, these things are linked and it links back to your questions about hiring. I mean, one of the truths, and I think it's a truth that did get obscured in you know, the, the labor market that uh, is now increasingly the past uh, in tech. But the reality is that it's very, very difficult to train and develop somebody who was a poor fit for the job in the first place. Hiring, training, performance management, professional development are linked. And the fact that they don't work out here doesn't mean they're bad. This is not a moral judgment. But it means it's just not a good fit because of our model or whatever. So that's why you want to pay a lot of attention at the front end, as because as you pointed out earlier, there's false positives in human capital, as well as in uh, uh, sales prospects. Fair enough. All right. Final question. Uh, in the book, you talk about technology, how technology allows companies to measure almost everything. So managers end up measuring everything, which has resulted in a prolification of uh, immaterial KPIs and so forth. And we kind of get into you know, how to lose the focus. And with that teed up, you wrote an article in 2015 titled what salespeople need to know about the B2B landscape. If you were to write that article today, here in 2023 uh, with the same title, what would people read about? Well, let me let me begin by answering your question and telling you what I would not emphasize, because I think this is what most people are emphasizing. And that is, you know, that somehow the future of sales management is uh, in technology. However, we define that buzzword, you know, mm -hmm. uh, tech is a tool. And in fact, the good news about the tool is that it is increasingly user friendly. So that is not what I would emphasize, I would emphasize three things. First, as always, the most important thing about selling is the buyer and the buying process. And the reality in the vast majority of businesses, it is now an omni-channel buying world. Ultimately, that demands a multi-channel response on the part of the seller. Learning how to deal with channel partners as well as your own uh, sales force. The second thing I would say, and I think the pandemic um, accelerated this trend, but essentially getting FaceTime with buyers, whether it's real FaceTime or virtual FaceTime, is getting harder. Mm -hmm. And precisely because buyers have access to search technologies and buyer forums and other places, where they can get product and pricing information, the amount of time that salespeople get with the buyer on average is in fact decreasing. Um, that leads to uh, the, the, um, the third point that I would make, and that is the information revolution, which is likely to continue through our lifetimes. What that means ultimately is that your salespeople have to sharpen their ability 
around the basics, their ability to clarify and communicate that value proposition. You know, every day, buyers in most organizations are hearing from vendors that say, I can increase your productivity, I can make you better, et cetera. You're just part of that noise until you can clarify and customize that value proposition. So those would be the three things I would talk about. Omnichannel buying, um, uh, FaceTime, uh, making the most of that. Getting more and time then, with your prospects. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, the information revolution and what that means for salespeople. The technology part, um, I, I again, I think technology there is increasingly our friend. It does generate, as you said earlier, a plethora of data, right. but that's ultimately a management issue. The, the management, uh, what managers ultimately get paid for or should get paid for is knowing what data and information are particularly relevant in their business. And the good okay. news is they have more choices. The bad news is many of them do not know. Well, that's, that's why we replace managers. Well, there you have it. Frank, thank you so much for uh, sitting through my questions and being on the show. I've learned a ton. I know the audience has learned a ton. Where can they find you if they want to learn more about you? Or should they just go to Amazon, pick up the book? What are your thoughts on reaching out to you? Well, I mean, first of all, thank you. Uh, flattery will get you everywhere uh, <laughs> with me, Mr. Williams. Um, it's, you know, it's, it, I'm no uh, secret. You can go to LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, the book is published by uh, Harvard Business Review Press. You can get that most anywhere. I also have a website, but if I'm honest, I haven't been to my own website in like 18 months. So <laughs> it's not exactly going to win best practice awards in Mine either. Uh, website <laughs> design and content. And of course, there's always Amazon uh, to order the book online.